Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? I apologize for our little mic mishap, but I want to welcome you tonight to our first ever virtual bison tour mini session. We want to thank you all for joining us and we're especially grateful for your interest. Without people like you and the support we receive from our Crane Trust members, the work we do here and the views you're seeing now would not be possible. So we would like to introduce ourselves. My name is Kylie Warren. Uh, my name is Josh Weesey. I am a Habitat Manager here at the Crane Trust. Um, and uh, I've been chatting with you guys online while the mic has been on. I am a media specialist and I am the person who created the images you're about to see. So what you're seeing now is footage we actually captured this afternoon at one of our watering holes. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves in the comments. If you have not done so yet, we would love to know where you're watching from. Uh, as mentioned, we are watching from Wood, Wood River slash Alda, Nebraska. That's in central Nebraska on the Platte River. And feel free to tell us uh, any questions you might have about bison or why you came to this program tonight. So as you know, we do have a variety of uh, virtual cameras on the property that we are able to live stream to you. This is one such camera. This is our Platte River Camera 2. And if you have joined us during crane season, you will have noticed that there were many cranes on this view. Uh, bison, however, are very different. We can't just set a live camera in front of them and expect people to see bison. So bison move quite frequently around the pastures where they graze. And so to bring you tonight's program, we had to pre-record everything. Please do know we did so from a safe, in um, a safe distance using primarily long lens cameras. So we're going to take you back to the pre-recorded bison. And yes, our river cameras can be viewed anytime with a crane, a crane Trust membership. And then to answer that question about whether you can see our crane trust cameras outside of crane season, yes, absolutely you can. We do have them rolling all year round except when the power goes down and we have to reset them. So the footage we are going to bring you tonight, in addition to this beautiful watering hole, is um, a footage from our bison pastures, uh, which we drive around in a four-wheeler or pickup truck in order to stay safely away from the bison to give them their space, but also to keep an eye on them. We'll have some imagery of baby bison calving. We will have some wallowing and obviously some grazing uh, footage, as well as uh, some bison at sunset. 
and we might even have time to show you around some of the other footage we've captured of other species at Crane Trust. So since we are starting at the watering hole, um, I wanted uh, Josh to jump on and talk a little bit about bison and tell us about their relationship with water if he can. Well, as some of you guys um, probably caught in the chat, I've been talking a little bit about bison and their relationship to water, um, specifically as opposed to cattle. Um, bison tend to um, have lower water requirements than cattle. Um, they tend to be able to travel further away and make less frequent stops, um, which makes them pretty ideal for um, you know being a grazer on a pretty um, arid environment. Um, these bison here really kind of uh, buck the tradition of traditional thinking of bison avoiding uh, wetlands. They actually um, they do kind of avoid wetlands um, throughout most of the most of the year. In the summertime, though, they will come down to those watering holes and uh, cool off. Um, and then they also like this one because it's near um, spots for them. That foot traffic is pretty important um, as bison come down to these watering holes in the heat of the summer. Um, that would have knocked down cattails and things like bulrush um, and opened up that vegetation community for more um, forby species and flowering species um, that preferred open kind of mud flat territory. Um, so that it's really important that I've thrown some footage of other species in with this bison footage. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between bison and other species here at Crane Trust? Sure, Kylie. Um, the grasslands evolved and all the species that uh, exist within grasslands evolved under the pressure of grazing. Um, bison as a numerous and large um, migrating uh, grazing animal would have had dramatic influences on the species that evolved in this area. So they, the grasses evolved to um, withstand drought and also withstand um, pulse um, grazing by large, large herds of bison moving across the Great Plains. Um, with that, all the other species um, evolved to uh, to withstand or to prefer different types of habitat that bison are creating or leaving behind. So um, what they may be leaving behind tall vegetation in unpreferred areas. Some of those um, grassland species uh, um, have evolved to prefer to nest in those, uh, in those ungrazed areas. Um, some species like the grasshopper sparrow um, has evolved to uh, really like to like the areas that bison prefer. So they are in areas that 
um, have been heavily grazed by bison. So different species, again, like the up upland sandpiper, um, prefer a little bit of both. They like a open habitat for, um, for hanging out in, and then they like a little bit of shrubbiness um, or a little bit of uh, tall grass next to it to be able to nest in. So different species um, prefer different levels of disturbance, and bison are um, disturbing the land in different ways um, based upon where they prefer to graze, where they prefer to spend their time. We had a bison wallowing up here in the upper right-hand corner there. Or sorry, left-hand corner. You can kind of see them getting up now. We're going to talk about wallowing next. And there's the calf having a go. So this footage we're about to look at was recorded a few nights ago in one of our pastures and it will depict bison uh, walking and wallowing. Uh, Josh, can you talk a little bit about wallowing? Uh, we did talk about disturbances to the landscape. How does wallowing in particular help uh, the landscape and the habitat that the bison are living in? So again, uh, wallowing is kind of a unique behavior. Um, cattle do it as well, but not to the extent um, and frequency that bison do. Um, so wallowing by bison is essentially um, multiple fold. So there it serves for multiple reasons. So one reason is to, um, as to essentially scratch themselves. Um, there's a lot of bugs out here on the prairie and a lot of things bothering them. So they get down and scratch their hide. Um, another is they use that technique to help them shed um, their winter fur. Um, they also do it to uh, put dust on their thinner summer coat uh, to help them get gain some sun protection. Um, and that also helps uh, protect from insects as well. Um, and then another reason a bison might wallow is that they um, are doing it as a way to exert their dominance. Male bison will often go and wallow in one of their holes um, and they will, um, you know, kind of show their power and they'll do a lot of grunting and maybe a little bit of urinating in that wallow. Um, and you'll see another male bison come up a few moments later and do much to the same behavior, kind of showing um, and creating that territory.
so that wallow behavior, like I said, is kind of unique for bison. They um, are doing it um, and creating a, an open ground space. So we talked about those different levels of disturbance. We have, you know, kind of most preferred high grazing areas. We have these less preferred low grazing areas, some of these intermediately grazed areas. Um, and then these loafing areas, these wallowing areas, and they are beating down that vegetation um, even more. Wallowing is really good at removing grass that's resilient to grazing and opening up um, bare ground space for forbs to develop. You will find um, some different wildlife, um, especially in bigger areas um, where bison are wallowing. Oftentimes you'll see different small mammals um, like a uh, kangaroo rat might use a bison wallow or um, here we have our zapis mice that also like to use the bison wallows. These areas are important sunning areas for different herpetofauna like lizards um, and they create different bare ground spots for um, ant colonies and things like that to move in. And you'll see some of these birds that are um, buzzing by um, and hanging out with the bison. Those are brown-headed cowbirds, or as they should have been called, brown-headed bison birds. Those are native birds to, um, to Nebraska and throughout most of the Great Plains. These birds followed bison in large flocks, um, often picking off the um, bugs off of bison or near bison and the insects that would have um, would have frequented the bison uh, dung that they deposit as they graze throughout the landscape. An interesting fact about uh, brown-headed cowbirds is that they don't actually make their own nest. They um, exhibit what's called nest parasitism, so they actually lay their eggs in other birds' nests and la allow that other bird to raise their young. As we continue to watch our programming, uh, I want to remind anybody that has any questions about bison um, to feel free to drop those in the chat and I will try to answer them accordingly.
So we had a question from uh, Kate about a calf that looked like it might have had an injured back leg. Um, we do experience a, a few cases of foot rot. I'm not sure exactly if that calf um, had foot rot, but um, being so close in proximity to the groundwater here on the Platte River, um, it's not just a problem we have with the bison, but um, cattlemen often see a lot of foot rot down um, here in the lower part of the plains. Uh, typically, we uh, have a pretty, uh, we'll say hands-off approach to managing the bison um, as far as we want them to be wild animals. Um, however, we do not, want them, do not want to see them suffer or to go through any um, um, any any unnecessary um, uh, trauma due to the fact that they cannot freely move throughout um, and migrate as they would have done historically. Um, historically they would have not had fences and they would have been able to move to higher ground um, if they needed to or go find things like um, natural salt licks. Due to that fact, we offer a, um, a kind of a, a free mineral, um, a multi-mineral for them to freely come and um, attend as they need to. Um, and we do offer an iodine salt lick block um, out there for them as well. That iodine salt is um, essential to help prevent that those foot rot issues. If we do notice that there's um, kind of a frequent case of foot rot, we treat them with a general antibiotic um, to help them, you know, kind of bring them out of that. And most cases that antibiotic, which is commonly referred to as Draxin, um, will uh, kind of bring them out of that and they won't have any long-term effects. We had a question asking about um, the bison being genetically pure, um, and I just want to address that through the audio. I did it a little bit through the chat. So um, our bison have a very low level of cattle integration um, based upon the known nuclear markers for, um, for uh, integration of cattle genetics into bison genes. Basically what that means is the areas that they have been looking for and the areas of the genetic um, material that they've been looking for in, in the bison um, have not been showing that we have any cattle genetics. However, there's a lot of debate um, and a p paper was just recently published really questioning on if there is any truly pure um, bison out there. Um, and the paper kind of concluded that there was so much experimental crossing um, that had happened really early on before you know really good records were being kept about um, that paper true um, based upon the known nuclear markers for um, for uh, integration of cattle genetics into bison genes. Basically, what that means is the areas that they have been looking for and, and the areas of the genetic um, material that they've been looking for in, in the bison. Um, have not been showing that we have any cattle genetics. However, there's a lot of debate um, and a p paper was just recently published really questioning on if there is any truly pure um, bison out there. Um, and the paper kind of concluded that there was so much experimental crossing um, that had happened really early on before you know really good records were being kept about the last few remaining bison. Um, that they kind of concluded that there has to be some level of integration probably throughout all bison. Now the level to which um, was inconclusive and we're still monitoring those things um, as, we, uh, as we keep our bison herd and make our decisions on which animals um, to stay in the herd. Our herd is also very genetically um, diverse making this a, a making the crane trust an important not only um, bison herd genetically but a bison herd that's important for genetic research 
Um, so we uh, track our genetics over the long term since we've had the bison, and we essentially keep our we keep female um, calves to replace the older females and conserve our um, diverse genetics within our herd. And we um, introduce new bull bison at a young age to naturally integrate into the herd and come up uh, as a come up through the dominance and social hierarchy naturally. Um, and we introduce them from um, historic herds that we know that we don't have very much genetic representation from or we have none from. And we again track these bison every year um, during our cattle working. Bison working, sorry. Uh, we have a question from two dogs asking if there's any known historical wallows in the valley, um, the Platte Valley, or specifically known crossings, uh, crossing areas along the Platte River. I think that's a really great question. Um, crossing areas along the Platte River, well, the Platte River doesn't look the same as it used to. It's much more incised, meaning that um, the river has lost sediment um, and has become deeper and deeper and more channelized. Um, historically, the Platte River would have been um, a very shallow, very, very wide river with um, kind of generally or uh, gradually sloping banks rather than a steeper, sharper bank. So really, crossing would have been more of a matter not of where but when. So they would have been crossing at times when the river would have been the lowest and it was the easiest to traverse. Um, as far as known wallows, um, that's a, another hard question. Um, as you are probably well aware, most of the Platte Valley has been tilled or farmed or altered in a lot of ways. Um, and the few relic sites that remain um, are now you know, covered by a lot of invasive plants. Um, and a lot of the, um, you know, the wallows quickly revegetate with time because grasslands are disturbance tolerant. So um, there may be wallow-like depressions, but it's hard to determine whether those depressions were truly wallows or if they're a natural occurrence in the topography. However, in the sand hills, they're pretty con conclusive that they have very large wallows that still remain. There's an endangered plant species called the blowout penstemon um, that occurs in the sand hills of Nebraska that they believe that bison had a very important part of keeping um, areas of sand open through their wallowing activities and allowing the wind um, to continue to keep those open in the sand hills and allow that plant that only grows in those open sand areas to grow. So with the loss of bison across much of the sand hills, we've lost many of those blowout penstemons and the appropriate habitat type um, having kind of cascading effects on that plant um, leading to its endangered listing. Thank you, Josh, for that update. That's really fascinating stuff.
So um, we have another couple of questions here. Um, so at, this one asked when the Crane Trust Bison program started. So we started a pilot program kind of about borrowing a few bison in 2014 to make sure that, you know, that they were going to be okay, that they were going to thrive. Um, so we borrowed some bison from somebody and um, uh, for, about, uh, for about a year and found out that we felt like the bison were healthy and they looked good and that there was no you know major risk other than making sure the infrastructure was intact so um, in january of 2015 we introduced our first 46 bison um, and from there the herds grown by those additions and calving um, yeah so we are now nearing our grazing objectives at least until we um, start adding more bison fence when we can um, and through support of people like you and donors and interested parties, um, hopefully one day that will be possible to, um, you know, increase the herd size or maybe even put bison on other people's land throughout the Platte River. Um, so cattle are also used um, on the Crane Trust as a grazer. Um, the, we use cattle on Mormon Island, which is the um, largest intact wet meadow left on the Platte River so it's seasonally flooded um, meadow area left and um, we use them for a couple of reasons one is that these bison here are closer to the office and a place where we can keep an eye on them in case anything happens um, the other is the infrastructure so the cost to fence off Mormon Island with with bison fence um, it's a six strand fence that's six foot high um, it's it's a pretty costly and time-consuming um, endeavor so we do hope one day to get them out there as well and and maybe get to a point where we only use bison but again as I had mentioned the changes that have ha happened to the landscape um, so there's things like invasive species fire suppression and, and woody and species encroachment onto the grasslands becoming making them shrublands or woodlands um, and cattle can be used in a really effective way. Um, we can force cattle to graze longer um, with more cattle on a spot for a longer duration than these bison. So we can kind of manipulate cattle grazing in a way that um, helps us meet our management objectives, be that control an invasive species or open up ground space more to plant with native forbs um, or to um, uh, to, to beat down an area because of, um, for, for other reasons, say we, we um, want this area next to a place we're about to burn to be grazed low so there it decreases the risk of that fire spreading. Okay, I just want to say that I appreciate that, um, that sentiment and that your donation definitely counts and does do uh, does contribute to our work here with the bison. So I wanted to share some footage of bulls. Um, these are bull bisons hanging out on what um, I love to call the prairie savanna. Josh, can you talk a little bit about why bulls like to isolate so much? So, um, bison in general are kind of gregarious. They're group forming animals. However, bulls uh, tended to historically move um, from between female groups um, and increase their chances of, of getting a chance to reproduce. Uh, so historically, uh, these bison, male bison, would have um, s spent time kind of away from the females until the rut started. It really decreases their risk, um, especially for younger bulls that are bulls that are less dominant in the herd. Um, they decrease their risk by not spending time with those females and not having to contend with the bigger bulls in the herd at that time or the most dominant bulls in the herd at that time. Um, however, as we approach rut, the rut, which is the breeding season, um, which we're coming upon here in the end of July to the beginning of August is kind of when that starts. Um, you'll kind of see these these lonely bulls. Um, they will find their way back to the females to um, do what they are uh, ingrained to do.
we had a quick question about uh, gestation time. Yeah, gestation is about the same as a cow, so we're looking at like that nine and a half month period. So we have a question about how to tell males and females apart. So um, besides general body size, so males tend to be, you know, at least three quarters again the size or even twice the size of um, the females. But um, I look at their horns. So males generally have uh, straighter horns that go kind of pointed more up and out as the females will have more recurved horns where they kind of tilt in sort of towards each other like a halo. Um, and that's kind of the way that I tell them apart. The young um, bison, um, like the two-year-old bulls, their horns are pretty spread apart. So they actually kind of point out before they start to recurve up. And mainly the reason, the evolutionary reason for those horn differences is males tend to fight um, each other more. So having that pointy horn is at their advantage where females tend to be more defenders of their calves having that rounder horn to fend off um, any potential predators. So this is our final couple of shots for the evening. Uh, before we get too deep into it, I did kind of want to show you some of the other things happening around Crane Trust over the last three or four months. Uh, we've been collecting some footage of other birds and species and I'm happy to share that with you now.
Sorry about that glitch. And in this little reel, we do have our very first baby bison. So currently we have four main pastures that the bison have access to or can be moved uh, throughout. Um, right now they have access to um, two of those pastures. So in any given time, um, there may be one to three of those pastures open depending on management objectives for the habitat.
All right, we're going to show you a few more uh, highlights here at the Crane Trust. Spoiler alert, there will be no cranes in this highlight series. You'll have to join us for crane season to see them. So our last virtual program was all about prairie chickens. Uh, we do have a lek here on the site. It is a research lek. Uh, however, uh, we do like to bring virtual programming of this research lek to you in the mid to late spring. We had a question about disease transmission with or between um, cattle. Um, is that something we're concerned about? So it's definitely on our radar um, with things like brucellosis and mycoplasma um, wreaking havoc potentially within different bison herds. However, it's part of our bison management plan to actually quarantine uh, areas where cattle have been before bison get access to that area. So John, in general, we give them, you know, maybe even six months to a year of rest between um, when cattle are uh, having access to an area before we decide to reintroduce bison. So um, they're kept pretty ex ex uh, excluded from the cattle at the moment. So again, reducing that potential risk. These are deer at Mormon Island. Currently, um, we also look after Mormon Island. Uh, Josh, do you want to talk a little bit about Mormon Island and um, what goes on there a little bit? Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, Mormon Island's the largest uh, intact um, and contiguous tract of relic wet meadow that never, never been tilled, seasonally flooded um, kind of wetland um, that we have um, and that's left on the Platte River. So this site was in um, called kind of back in the 70s Mormon Island Crane Meadows because people knew that's where the cranes went and when the uh, Crane Trust was formed to protect whooping crane habitat along the Platte River uh, it was very obvious that one of the first places that needed to be protected was Mormon Island Crane Meadows um, and it became under Crane Trust ownership at that point um, and so we protect that piece of land that's buffered um, by easements um, and through other land holdings that we ha have. Um, easements essentially help us um, afford to protect a piece of land but not have to buy that piece of land. So we work with a landowner to provide them um, some sort of subsidy um, on the price of their land to not develop it any further than it already is developed. So bison's pop, top speed in a short burst is up to like 30 miles an hour. Um, they don't sustain it for very long. Um, however, they can keep a trot up, um, you know, about 15 to 20 miles an hour for quite quite a distance, a couple miles. So we are nearing the end of our program for tonight. If you have any last minute questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments and we'll get to them as quickly as possible. We want to thank you all for joining us tonight.
We want to thank you all in return. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you do have any feedback, feel free to email us at virtual at cranetrust.org. We would love to bring improved and uh, a quality of excellence to this program, so please feel free to send us your thoughts. So I'm just going to ask Josh here if he has any last words here for you all tonight. Well, I guess in closing, I just wanted to say that, you know, what we do here and how we do it and why we do it is important. You know, there's not much left of the prairie, um, specifically not in the central in central Nebraska. Um, and these bison being returned onto the prairie after 150 years of their absence is quite a feat. Um, and I just want to thank everybody out here for supporting us um, by view viewing us, um, whether, you know, whether you're from Nebraska or from far away, it all helps um, to raise awareness of what we do here and why these things are important. Um, and, you know, we hope to see you guys out here in March. And, uh, you know, we will talk more about what we can do to bring more um, virtual experiences of this great and wonderful place to you all. Thank you all and have a great night. Thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. And as a reminder to you all, we do have our, mem our members exclusive programming for tomorrow night. Uh, we will go into more depth about bison. We will talk a little bit about how we work the bison every December. And we will bring you more footage. Uh, with that being said, if you would like to join us tomorrow night, please log on to cranetrust.org and click on how to help and become a member of the Crane Trust. I will post that link in the comments. And once again, thank you so much for joining us all tonight. Uh, this has been a mini session of our guided bi bison virtual tour. Um, I have to go back out in the field and get more footage now, so uh, I want to just um, remind you that we could not do the work we do here at Crane Trust without your support and without Crane Trust membership support. If you are tuning in tonight as a member, we want to pay a special thank you for your support and we appreciate and rely on it so we can continue to protect and maintain the physical, hydrological, and biological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River uh, we want to make sure it stays strong for cranes, sandhill cranes, bobwhites, herons, white-faced ibis, deer, bobo lynx, prairie chickens, killdeer, all kinds of moths and insects, and of course, our beautiful great American bison. Please join us again tomorrow night at 6 p.m., and we wish you all a good evening.